Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. You may know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on how to interpret Scripture. It's a fascinating series, I think, and gives us a lot of challenging ideas to think about. This particular lesson is lesson number nine in the series, entitled Creation, Genesis as Foundation, and it's number two on that particular subject. It's for May 30 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, how can we praise you enough? How can we thank you enough for what you've done in making all of this very important information available to us. We come now asking for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we study some of the historical details that verify and prove to us that your word is reliable and dependable and that we should study it more faithfully each day. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before the days of evolutionary theory and Darwin, many great thinkers were inspired by the scripture's explanation of the creation of our world. Some of those who recognized this were Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, John Ray, Robert Boyle, and many other great scientists of the past. But the French Revolution led to people thinking that they did not need God, and in fact, that they were better off without God. This atheistic worldview led them to look for some other explanation for the origins than creation by God. These ideas got a great boost when Charles Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of Species, in 1844 and finally published it in 1859. It's interesting that he waited 15 years after writing it before he finally published it. And if you know the history, he only published it because he realized that someone else was about to basically publish the same sort of thing and so he said, I better publish mine really quick before the other guy beats me. Well, does 1844 remind you of anything? Yes. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Adventists. Yes. And finally, uh, does, he, uh, does the fact that many people are looking for the second coming of Jesus suggest that Satan needed to do something to try to counterfeit? Hmm, there's a thought. Yeah, I would think so. so what does the Bible actually teach about the origin of our world? Is it possible that Moses, in writing Genesis, was simply expanding on pagan ideas about creation? Or was Moses perhaps culturally conditioned and just expressing ideas that were common in his day? These are issues we want to deal with in this lesson. So we're going to deal with a lot of historical material and sort of get an idea of what the background was of some of these ancient things. Well, let's take an interesting idea. Does the Bible teach that the earth is flat? Many believe that idea until relatively recently. Does the idea that there are four corners to the earth suggest a flat earth? Um, if you remember what it says in Revelation 7 verse 1, it says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. Now, is that to suggest that there are, it's a flat earth with corners? There's Revelation 20, says something similar. These verses should be understood in a metaphorical sense, suggesting the four directions of the compass. We use other expressions that seem to suggest that same idea very commonly. This is not to, suge to suggest that there are actually corners on our world. There are many modern equivalents to these ideas. We talk about the sun rising and setting. We know perfectly well that it's not the sun rising and setting. It's because we're spinning around, and so it goes, it disappears over there, and then it comes back over here. It has nothing to do with the sun itself rising or setting. It's just a function of how our earth spins. There are many other similar expressions in the Bible and in modern writings. So what does the Old Testament teach us about the nature of this earth? Jim, you got something on that? Uh, Job uh, 26, uh, starting at verse 7 to 10. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth upon nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds, and the clouds is not rent under them. He covers the earth of the moon, excuse me, he covers the face of the moon and spreads over it his cloud. 
He has described a circle upon the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. Okay, now we have here on, on the handout, we have the Good News Bible, and you're reading from? This is the RSV. RSV, very good. And Carrie, something more on that? Isaiah 40, yes. 21 and 22? <clears throat> Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle. And in this uh, uh, rendition, it's in the... An alternate reading is vault. Vault of the earth, yes. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Okay, that's the New American Standard Bible. So we're looking at two different versions here. Well, in these two passages, we see that the earth is hung or suspended in space and that it is a circle or a sphere. Uh, and God, is, with the passage there, said that God dwells above the circle of the earth. Try to imagine yourself as a person living thousands of years ago. What evidence would you have to suggest that the earth is moving? Would you have any evidence to suggest that the earth is spherical? Well, the earliest documented mention of the spherical earth concept dates from around the 5th century BC, when it was mentioned by ancient Greek philosophers. It remained a matter of speculation until the 3rd century BC, when Hellenistic astronomer established the spherical shape of the earth as a physical fact and calculated the earth's circumference. And Charles, I think you were going to finish that for me. Yes. Uh... The paradigm? I'm sorry, I, I can go ahead. No, no, okay, go ahead. The, you, you didn't finish the... No, the first paragraph. The paradigm was gradually adopted through the old world during late antiquity and the Middle Ages. For example, Armenian scientist An 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 Anania Shrikatsi subscribed to the idea of a spherical Earth. That was from 610 to 685 A.D., a practical demonstration of Earth's sphericity was achieved by Ferdinand Magellan and Juan Sebastián Elcano's circumnavigation. Okay, you want to read the last there? Sure. The concept of a spherical Earth displaced earlier beliefs in the flat Earth. In early Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian mythology, the world was portrayed as a flat disk floating in the ocean with an hemispherical sky dome above. And this forms the premise for early world maps like those of uh, Anaximander and Hecateus oh of Miletus. Okay, but, there's some challenging words in there. <laughs> yeah, so what we're saying is that the ancients believed that the world itself was flat, but there was a, a half spear dome over it, and, and that's where all this other stuff was located. It was moving around on this half spear. That was the ancient idea. Around 500 BC, Pythagoras suspected that the Earth was round because the sun and the moon were round, and other planets seemed to be round. So if that's round, and this is round, and that's round, maybe we're round too. Aristotle also thought so around 200 years later. In 240 BC, Eratosthenes, the director of the museum at Alexandria in Egypt, calculated the circumference of the earth as about 40,000 kilometers. And it's amazing how accurate he was. Um, what he actually did was this. Someone discovered that about 600 miles south of Alexandria where he lived, there was a well that had been dug right straight down into the ground. It was very deep. And lo and behold, he discovered one day a year, you could see the, the sun shining right straight, and you could see it shining on the water at the bottom of the well. So he said, hmm, that means that on that particular day, the sun is right straight over this. Well, on that day, how is the sun, what angle is the sun over here where we are? And he, he put a stick up, and he said, oh, it's about so many degrees. Yeah. And he said, hmm, if that's the case, and this over here, it's straight up and down, it's so many degrees over here, then if it's a circle, 
you can, and he calculated almost precisely accurately from that simple little experiment, the circumference of the earth. He was only off by a couple hundred kilometers out of 40,000. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. The, um, you, can, you can find that, by the way, um, if you look up Eratosthenes on, on your YouTube, if you want to look at that information. Even 600 and even before and after, how did the Arabs cross through the, these deserts, yeah. you see, with their camels? They had to be precise. Well, they used the North Star. Mm -hmm. And then a simple um, plank of wood. Yeah. And then they would, I'm not sure how they do it. Then, then there are the beads mm -hmm. to say this is how many degrees, how many degrees. And they would very accurately reach the, yeah. the places that they didn't need it to because they had to or else there's no and water, they would die. You can't miss the oasis. They couldn't miss it. And how brilliant these guys were. The yeah. very simple thing. Exactly. Very simple. And they knew. Somewhat similar to those thinkers who lived more than a thousand years after he lived, when Moses wrote the book of Job, around 1500 B.C., he called the earth a circle. He was only a thousand years ahead of his time. <laughs> Review what you know about Genesis 1-1 to 2-4 and regarding the creation of human beings. And we don't have time to read that whole story, but you remember the simple story about how God created this earth in, seven, in six days of the, the physical earth, and then on the seventh day he rested. And then chapter 2 talks about the details of creating Eve at, from, Ad, from Adam's rib and so forth like that. So that's our simple Bible story. So what did other pagan ideas uh, believe about that? Jim, do you have something about? I think it's down there somewhere. When the gods? It's got to be down here. When the gods, there we go, instead of man, did the work, bore the load, the God's load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. <laughs> let the womb goddess create offspring, and let man bear the load of the gods. Geshitu, or something, Geshitu, a god who had intelligence, they slaughtered in their assembly. Nintu mixed clay with his flesh and blood. That's from Stephanie Daly, the myths from Mesopotamia, the creation, the flood, Gilgamesh, and others. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Read the next paragraph there for us. Yeah, I'll have it. There you go. I think. Uh, is it that one? I, no, it's yeah. the next one. Page three. Okay. Astrohasis is the title of an 18th century B.C. Akkadian epic recorded in various versions on clay tablets. It is named for its protagonist, Atrahasis, whose name means exceedingly wise. Atrahasis tablets include both a creation myth and a flood account, which is one of the three surviving Babylonian deluge stories. Wow. So here's somebody living about approximately the time of Abraham, and he wrote down some material, and he's, I mean, he had a flood story, but his creation story, the gods are fighting, they're tired of doing the work, so what do they do? They take one of the other gods that's unaware of what they're about to do, they kill him, and mix his, his blood and his flesh with clay, and, and they make a world out of it. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound like something that would be the predecessor to, uh, to Genesis? No, not really. So what are the similarities? So what are the differences between the biblical account and the account and the Atrahasis account? Carrie? Yes. The first one in Atrahasis, man works for the gods so that the gods can rest. In Genesis, God created the earth and everything in it for humans as the apex of creation and then he rests with them. In Genesis, humans also are placed in a garden and invited to commune with God and care for his creation, a concept not found in Atrahasis. Number two, in Atrahasis, a minor god is killed and his blood is mixed with clay to form seven males and females. In Genesis, 
First Adam is formed intimately by God who breathes life into him and woman is made later to be his helper. That came from New King James Version. God didn't create Adam and Eve from the blood of a slain God. The third one, there is no sign of conflict or violence in the Genesis account as found in the Atrahasis story. The biblical account is sublime in depicting an omnipotent, an omnipotent rather, God who provides humanity with dignified purpose in the perfect world. This radical difference has caused scholars to, to conclude that, in the end, these are very different creation accounts. Wow. I should say so. It should be very obvious that the role of God and his relationship to human beings in the biblical story is very, very different from that depicted in Atrahasis. So what are we to assume? Is it possible that the Atrahasis epic was a corrupted story handed down through the generations from the times of the flood while the account given to us by Moses is the divinely inspired record and the version handed down through the faithful descendants of Adam and Noah of what actually happened? Well, we'd like to think that, huh? Yeah. What other differences do we find in the Genesis account versus the paganistic accounts? Before, before you move on, yeah. this womb goddess thing, womb goddess, yeah. this concept is still carried on in major religions of this world today. Yes. Well, that's, that's Catholicism, the way they, they had the, the virgin with, oh. and they... Yeah. Bel Haddad, you yeah. see, even uh, Germany, there's a clock, okay, and then this, every hour they meet, Bel Haddad. Oh, wow. Bel Haddad. I mean, this is crazy. They're the, what did they, the, the bread that's, okay, yeah. on that, the, the, the thing that's in it, that the bread sits on and the priest brings it yeah. up, that one has the plate has a moon there, mm -hmm. womb. Yeah. 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 And yes, another major religion of the world. Yeah. Exactly the same thing, yeah. the moon and the star. Well, what does it say there in Genesis 1, 14 to 19? <sighs> yes. Then God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let there be for let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years up to 14 right yeah 19 up to 19 and let them let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and let let be so then god made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and morning were the fourth day. Now, it's very interesting to notice that Moses, who was very familiar with the gods of the Egyptians, having been raised there to be the next pharaoh, did something very subtle here, but very important. They worshiped the sun and the moon. So instead of saying God created the sun and God created the moon, which immediately to Egyptians' I, I, mind might be, oh, those are the gods we're supposed to worship. What does he say? There was a greater light and there was a lesser light. No sun, no moon specifically mentioned. There's no, no one could say, oh, he's telling us to worship the sun, he's telling us to worship the moon. God created them, obviously, for a specific function. We know what the sun does, we know what the moon does. To rule over the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. Review again the specific details of how great God created man and woman. And I'll read that for us, Genesis 2, 7, and then 18 through 24. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and man began to live. Now, you know, if you read the King James, it's, um, he, he, he takes a body and a soul, and, uh, I mean, a, a spirit, and he becomes a soul. Well, 
the soul there just is means a, a person, a being. Right. With breath. With, With breath. breath, yeah. That's right. That's the most important thing. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. So he took some soy from the ground and formed all the animals and all the birds. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And that is how they all got their names. So the man named all the birds and all the animals, but not one of them was a suitable companion to him. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the fresh flesh. I'm sorry. Do you... Um, I, always, I used to chuckle when the surgeons would talk about this. Uh, do you think you could do it as slick as God did? <laughs> <laughs> How long do you think it took to heal the wound? <laughs> right. Done, right? He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone, flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. That is why man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one. Um, and I smile because a lot of people take the idea, well, the reason men are superior to women is because women were taken out of man. Mm -hmm. And I remind them that every man from that day to this has been taken out of woman. Taken out of woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we better be careful how we use that argument. By contrast with that simple story, what do the pagan ancient Near Eastern myths suggest? Often it is suggested that humans were created to do the work because the gods got tired. We already read one of those stories. Mm -hmm. imagine, imagine living in a world created by the pagan ideas of gods being angry with humans and thus foisting upon them their work. Contrast that with the true story of God creating men and women to dominate our world and then walking with them in the cool of the evening. I mean, I... I when I think about that, it just, it's amazing. I mean, imagine walking, here you have this fabulous, fabulous garden that God has made for you, and you say, God, I just love this fruit and that fruit and this berry and these other things you made for us. And God says, great, tomorrow, see what else you can find. And he walked with them and they had other questions and he explained. I mean, imagine God coming down leaving what he's, all the other responsibilities he has and the rest of the universe, walking with Adam and Eve specifically to talk to them about the garden that he had made for them. Mm. It is interesting to note that there was a huge contrast between the pagan ideas and the God-given biblical idea, even in ancient times, just as there are contrasts between what we read in the Bible today and what fallible human beings are saying today. And why do you suppose there's that incredible contrast? Who's responsible for what? <sighs> well, we have God's side, don't we? Right, right. And oh, who's well. responsible for the other for side? For the other side, uh, the deceiver. No question about the it. The deceiver. If you, but, keep, if you can keep the people from reading yeah. what God has to say, then the... Adversary has the microphone, doesn't he? Really? Yeah. Yes. But what you just said, that they, they dwelt with the Creator. Yeah. And I'm thinking in heavens restored, not only Adam and Eve, but all his children from all over the world, God living with man. Yes. Wow, Emmanuel. how beautiful. Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. How beautiful that is. Yeah. You know? Fantastic. Yes. Well, in Genesis 5, we're not going to take time to read the whole chapter, but it talks about the descendants of Adam. And it lists them, and so father and son and father. I'd, let me read just a few verses, starting with verse 6. When Seth was, or let me start with 4. After that, Adam lived another 800 years after he has gave birth to Seth, and he had other children and died at the age of 930. When Seth was 105, he had a son Enosh, and then lived another 807 years. He had other children, died at the age of 912. And it goes on like that through a whole series of these uh, antediluvian people. And then in Genesis 11, after the, after the flood, we know at first the people of the whole world were, had only one language and used the same words. As they wandered about in the east, they came to a plain in Babylonia and settled there. They said to one another, Come! On, let's make bricks and bake them hard. So they had bricks to build 
they had bricks to build with and tar to hold them together. They said, now let's build a city with a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. I mean, you know, they are intentionally trying to do exactly the opposite of what God wants them to do. God says, spread out, take your flocks, spread out. And what do they say? Oh, no, not us. We don't want to do what God tells us to do. It's very interesting to note how the histories of these early beings who lived before the flood is actually recorded. Late chronogenealogies from 1 Chronicles 1, 18 to 27 corroborate these early accounts. And Jim, I think you have something there. There is one element that makes these genealogies unique in the Bible. They contain the element of time, causing some scholars to correctly call them chrono, chron, chrono, ge, uh, chronogeologies. Genealogies. Chron, chronogenealogies. Man, what a mouthful. They contain an interlocking mechanism of descent information coupled with spans of time so that when one when person one had lived X years, he fathered person two. And person one, after he fathered person two, lived X or Y years. And he fathered other sons and daughters. Genesis 5 adds the formula phrase, and all the days of the person one were Z years. This interlocking system would have precluded deleting certain gene generations or adding to them. Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 contain a continuous line of descent as corroborated by the first by first Chronicles 1 18 to 27 in which there are no added or missing generations. In this way the Bible interprets itself. This is from the Bible study guide for Wednesday, Wednesday May 27. And of course you know that uh that raises lots of questions among modern people with all the challenges they come up with from, gene from uh, geology and so forth. But it's pretty clear what the Bible says. Now, how to interpret it and so forth, um, that's what we've got to deal with. What have modern critics done with this ancient historical record? There have been numerous attempts to find ways to extend these time periods into much longer ages. How should we respond to those efforts? If we're going to take the Bible seriously, we must recognize that Genesis 5 and 11 are, Carrie? Both historical and theological, linking Adam with the rest of humankind and God with man in the realm of the reaches of space and time. Genesis 5 and 11, 10 to 26 provide the time framework and human chain that links God's people with the man whom God created as the climax of the six-day creation event of this planet. Uh, that yeah. came from Gerhard Hassel, the meaning of chrono, yeah. what's this, chrono genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11. I presume yeah. he was some kind of theologian or what? Yes, Andrews. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the, the challenge here is you have this record from Scripture, and there it is. I mean, this one first person and this born and born are like this and he lives this many years and so forth. And if you piece that all together, you come up with a pretty strict account of the number of years. And of course, when you get down past Abraham, you run out of, you run out of precise dating. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, these, these, are, these are ages that we struggle with. However, we must not make too big a deal out of chronologies because Paul himself said, Charles? Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Okay, and Titus 3.9, you have that too? Yeah, we're going to get to it. Titus 3.9. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. So here we see, uh, remember that in Paul's day, to the, to the Jewish hierarchy, everything depended on who you could prove you were related to. You had to be able to say, I'm a son of so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. 
And we see people like, for example, Levi, I'm sorry, um, Nehemiah, Ezra is what I'm think, trying to think of. Ezra in the Old Testament gives quite an extensive genealogy to prove that he was in the line, he was supposed to be one of the priests and so forth like that. But, and, and people, this was very important in their system. And Paul says, you can get yourself tied up in knots over these systems. And who's going to prove that, you know, if you, if you claim something, how do you know? Who, how's anybody else going to know if, if we, that's the case? We need to, however, remember that uh, Matthew and Luke, both of them do it. I think they had a purpose in mm -hmm. doing so. Yeah, um, it's very interesting to compare Matthew 1 with uh, Luke 3 because you'll find out that out of about between one of them has like 26 names and the other one traces all the way back to uh, God and I think it's right. 47 names or something like that and almost none of them agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's an explanation for that for those of you who haven't struggled with that question. It's very likely that Matthew, following the, the Jewish customs, traces the, the lineage of Jesus through Joseph, even though he wasn't related to Joseph at all. Luke, being a physician, a doctor, said, no, I'm going to chase, trace the lineage through Mary, because that was the only one that was really related, only human that was really related to Jesus. And he traced it, probably traced the lineage through Mary. And they were both descendants of David. So right. once you get to David and on back there, there there's no question. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Well, in our study for Thursday, May 28, we are asked to read the following passages, and there's a whole list of them there. What do these passages teach us? And this is all about God's creation and what you can learn from nature and so forth. Let me try to summarize, with because we don't have time to read the whole lot of them. The Creator God made human beings, male and female, he then married them and said, What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Human history is said to have started with the creation of the world. Through him, that is, through God, all things were made. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. He made heaven, earth, sea, and all that is in them. And I'm going to stop there for just a second. And let, I'm going to ask you out there to think about this. How much do you learn about God from the creation around you? How much good and how much evil do you see? Um, I go on a run very early every morning. before the, I start out before the sun gets up. This time of year, why the sun comes up usually shortly after I get started. And one side, I'll see a beautiful flower growing along my path. And I think, bye, that's wonderful. And the next thing I see is some rabbit has been run over by a car. And I think, oh, man, that's terrible. And so, you know, here, here we see. We see the results of sin. We see the results of God's work. And if you understand that both God and the devil are active here, you can probably live with it. But um, anyway, God not only created our world, but also out of darkness he created light. Adam was created first and then Eve. And Eve was deceived and then Adam intentionally joined her. That how can I give this give up this beautiful woman? They were made originally to be in the likeness of God. Later, in the days of Noah, eight people were saved by God in a boat. And did God tell those eight that they would be the only ones to be saved? Or what did He say? What did Noah preach? Preach for years of what was coming. The gates open. Yes. Come on in. You can come in. Enoch was the seventh direct descendant from Adam. In that early garden, there was the tree of life growing in the Garden of Eden. It bore fruit 12 times a year. And notice that New Testament writer supported the ideas that Genesis 1 through 11 is an accurate record of what actually happened. Look, for example, a very famous passage is Romans 5. I'm going to start with verse 12. Sin came into the world through one man, and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. There was sin in the world before the law was given, and, but where there is no law, no account is kept of sins. But from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, death ruled over the whole human race, 
even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam did when he disobeyed God's command. So what's Paul telling us? Does he believe that Adam existed? Does he believe that the story of the, the fall in the Garden of Eden is true? Absolutely. Adam was a figure of the one who was to come, but the two are not the same because God's free gift is not like Adam's sin. It is true that many people died because of the sin of that one man, but God's grace is much greater, and so is his free gift to so many people through the, his, the, through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. And there is a difference between God's gift and the sin of one man. After the one sin came the judgment of guilty. But after so many sins comes the undeserved gift of not guilty. It is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by the one man, Jesus Christ, all who receive God's abundant grace and are freely put right with him will rule and life through Christ. So then, as the one sin condemned all people, in the same way the one righteous act sets all people free and gives them life. Wow. In this detailed description of the plan of salvation, Paul repeatedly contrasted the fall of the first Adam with the salvation that is provided through Jesus Christ, whom he calls what? Second the second Adam. So how does that sound to you so far? If Jesus himself and the New Testament writers felt that the Genesis account was a reliable history, would it not be foolish for us, based on the claims of fallen, fallible human beings, to refuse to follow their example? Tim, I think you're up next again. The Bible is... I might need it too. I don't know. I get lost in this. It should be about 27, 28. The Bible is the most comprehensive and the most instructive history which men possess. It came fresh from the fountain of eternal truth and a divine hand has preserved its purity through all the ages. Here only can, excuse me, here only can we find a history of our race unsullied by human prejudice or human pride. Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, page 25. Okay. I have shown. I've been shown. Excuse me. I've been shown that without the Bible history, genealogy can prove nothing. Geology. Geology could prove nothing. Relics found in the earth do give evidence of a state of things differing many, in many respects, from the present. But the time of their existence and how long these periods have been in the earth are only to be understood by Bible history. It may be innocent. To conjecture beyond Bible history if our suppositions do not contradict the facts upon the sacred scriptures. But when men leave the word of God in regard to the history of creation and seek to account for God's creative works upon natural principles, they are upon a boundless ocean of uncertainty. Just how God accomplished the work of creation in six literal days, he has never revealed to mortals. His creative, work, his creative works are just as incomprehensible as his existence. Ellen White, Spiritual Gifts, Books 3, page 93. And I hope that someday when we get to heaven, and maybe when, maybe when God recreates this earth uh, at, at the third coming, he might do it the way he did it again at the first time. Wouldn't it be nice to watch him day one, day two, day three, day four? Wow. And then, you think there would be a reason to celebrate when that Sabbath came along? Wow. Mm. Let us remind ourselves that science to the modern mind means something that can be handled, heard, seen, tested, and repeatedly retested to prove that it is correct. This, of course, leads to controversies and debates. I mean, every scientific thing you know, there's somebody to contest it. So why should many people believe the theories of evolution about events which allegedly happened millions or even billions of years ago when those theories of origins cannot be tested scientifically? We don't want, they don't want to believe the Bible because it can't be tested scientifically. Can you test billions of years ago what happened? Of course not. You can't do anything. So why do they choose to believe that? 
Well, by definition, science has to deal with natural events. It has no way of testing supernatural events. Creation and the flood were supernatural events. So if you choose to rule out anything that is supernatural, of course, the Genesis account will have to be thrown out. So if it's something bigger than we can do, something that we can't explain, toss it out. Once again, we need to remind ourselves not to be caught up with an argument from some evolutionist suggesting, and this is a common occurrence, that he is arguing from science and that all we have is religion. Never allow a person to give you that argument. If the discussion is to be about evidence, we need to point out plenty of fallacies in their scientific arguments because there are many of them. I'm reading a book about that right now that just completely debunks so much of, of supposed evolutionary arguments. Well, what science was 10 years ago or even 10 months ago yeah. is not what it is today. Yeah. But the Bible is exactly the same from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the scientist wants you to believe that his interpretation right. of, these, of what's available is a correct one. But there are alternate interpretations. There are very different interpretations which would support our belief in Scripture. So there's no reason to, to just automatically accept his, his interpretation. If we accept his interpretations, then, of course, we have no foot to stand on because he can say whatever he wants, and we just have to accept it. However, the church also has been at folly, is calling the earth flat and killing people at stake. Yeah. In history. Yeah, In history, back. right. Not recently. <laughs> no. So, the, uh, if, they, if, they, if this person wants to discuss then religion, if they want to get out of science, we'll discuss science for science, but if he wants to discuss religion versus religion, he doesn't really have a foot to stand right. on. George Smith, a volunteer researcher in 1872, found in the basement of the British Museum an ancient Babylonian tablet contained references to Atnapushtim, the survivor of the worldwide flood, and to Gilgamesh, who sought to attain from him the secret to eternal life. Now, I, it's interesting. It, 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 I smile when I think about this. The British Museum has literally hundreds and thousands of things stored away here and there that nobody can read or nobody, As very time. few can read. And so this guy, I don't know if this is one, but the, I know there were several of them. People taught themselves how to read ancient cuneiform tablets and this kind of stuff. And they would come, after working during the day, they would come in the evening and say, and the bar, library said, please, please come and read these things because we don't even know what we have here. Well, one of those guys, 1872, found this story about Nepushtim and Gilgamesh. This was reported in newspapers around the world. Since then, scholars have documented worldwide flood stories from cultures on many places. Creation stories have also been found. This has raised several questions. Could the biblical account of Genesis 1 through 11 simply be borrowed from the ancient Near East? Are there mythical elements in that account? How do we explain the differences between the biblical account and any of these pagan accounts? Think of some of the times when science has been in direct conflict with the teachings of the Bible. Yeah. Galileo? Galileo, Galilei, concluded that the sun was the center of the solar system with the earth and the other planets revolving around the sun, that is, heliocentric worldview. But there were others in the Catholic Church who taught that the earth was the center of the universe, that is, a geocentric worldview. This led to a trial by the Inqui Inquisition, in which Galileo was forced to recant and was placed under house arrest until his death in 1642. The Galileo affair was often seen as has often been cited as an example in which the Bible holds back science. But this raises several questions. Did the church's interpretation, which was used to condemn Galileo, really derived from the Bible. Was Galilei, Galileo opposed to the Bible in favor of science? In fact, the Catholic Church had adopted a cosmology based on er, Greek Aristotelian, Aristotelian 
philosophy and Ptolemy's mathematics, which it then tried to defend on the basis of the Bible. Wow. Galileo responded by defending his interpretation on the basis of the Bible as well. First, he asserted that God is the author of both nature and the Bible. If both properly understood, they would be in harmony. Second, Galileo pointed out that later interpreters can err. Then he stated that the language used in the Bible is, adopt, is adapted to the common person and should not always be taken in a literalistic way. Finally, he argued against the consistency of the literal reading of Joshua's insistence that the sun stand still over Gibeah. That's Joshua uh, chapter that. 10, verse 11. Verse 12. Uh, verse 12 uh, let me read that real quick. Just okay. so. yeah. On the day that the Lord gave the men of Israel victory over the Am Amorites, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of the Israelites. He said, Sun, stand still over Gibeon. Moon, stop over Ijalon Valley. And the sun stood still and the moon did not move until the nation conquered its enemies. So how does that happen? In the light of the prevailing Ptolemaic view that the earth always was still and stood in the center of the universe, because in that case, the day would have been shorter, not longer. Richard Blackwell on the book Galileo and Bellarmine and the Bible, South Bend, uh, Indiana, Notre Dame, University Press. Today, there is no doubt which, the, which interpretation was correct, but it took the Catholic Church more than 350 years to exonerate Galileo, which it did in 1992. Wow. wow. Uh, but it's going to be Adult Bible Study Guide, pages 119 and 120. So, uh, what do we see here? Both of them, both sides in that case, were trying to argue from the Bible. Galileo had some scientific evidence to put alongside his biblical evidence, and they claimed they were supporting the Bible, but what were they really arguing from? They were arguing from uh, arguments, they were following arguments from Aristotle and Ptolemy from, from Egypt. They weren't, they weren't following the biblical uh, thing at all. Were those people perhaps included in Jesus' uh, condemnation when he says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, in Matthew 23? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a pretty broad taint, wasn't it? <laughs> but, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Who's left out of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what should we conclude, Kerry? Does the Bible contain an antiquated view of cosmology? For centuries, critical scholars thought that Genesis 1 reflected the ideas of the ancient Babylonians. Thus, they insisted that the term Tihom, or deep, derived from the name Tiamat, the goddess of the primeval ocean world in the Enuma Elish epic. The epic depicts the Babylonian god Marduk slaying Tiamat in mortal combat. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt there for a second. We read earlier about this, the other god that we talked about, a bunch of gods that took one of the gods, killed him and mixed up his blood and so forth, and his flesh with, with clay, and that's what they made the world and people out of. Well, here's a case, same general idea from a much more famous uh, epic, a new Malish epic, and here's Marduk, one of the leaders of the, of the gods, slays another important god and, and uses that p person to, to create things. Wow, go ahead. Today it is recognized that Tihom is simply a term for a large body of water that is completely non-mythical. In fact, it is impossible to conclude that Tihom, or ocean, was borrowed from Tiamat. Uh, then it says, David Toishio Tsumura, Genesis and Ancient Near Eastern Stories of Genesis and the Flood, an introduction. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff there. I think we might yeah, you don't go need on to. with it. Uh, Let me just comment about that. If you'd like to have all this evidence yourself, and, and if you want to use it in one of your classes at home or whatever, you can get our... our um, all of this material, our handouts, by going to our website at uh, theox.org. That's T H E O X dot O R G. And you can find out where all these things came from. 
to suggest that Dennis's Genesis, rather, one reflects a pagan conflict between the gods is to read into the text something that the text actually combats. The description of the passive, powerless, and unorganized state of the quote-unquote deep in Genesis 1-2 reveals that the term is non-mythical in content and anti-mythical in purpose. Okay. This teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide 120. So there's there's nothing in the Genesis account that would suggest that you know there's some kind of mortal battle going on between gods and now you know so, someone takes a dead god and and tries to make something out of it. Completely ridiculous. Yeah. Charles, you want to add to that? Yeah, the term regia. Is that how you pronounce it? Rakia. Rakia, Rakia. The term Rakia is sometimes translated firmament from the term firmamentum in the Vulgate Latin translation of the Old Testament, which gives a false impression that the firmament is a solid metal dome. However, the term Rakia is better rendered expanse, as can be seen in Psalms 19 verse 1 and Daniel 12 verse 3. Likewise, does rain literally come from the windows of heaven? Genesis 7, 11, Genesis 2, 8, I mean 8, 2. In other passages, barley, 2 Kings 7, 1, 2, trouble and anguish, Isaiah 24, verses 18 and 19, or blessings, Mal uh, Malachi 3, 10, come through the windows of heaven. Adult Sabbath School class. Yeah. Uh, so these are these are expressions that people use. Okay, we we the blessings come down from God, the rain comes from God, and so forth. And who makes all this grow? Who whatever? It's God that makes these things grow. So they, traditional, the ancients said these are blessings that come down from God. Where do they come from? Well, they come through the windows of heaven. Well, I mean. What did you expect of some ancient person to say? Get on your rocket ship and go to the moon and see where it came from or something mm -hmm. like that? No. Um, these are just simple ideas that were appropriate for the time. For Expressions those... of, of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the relationship between God and human beings? Bible writers repeatedly in both Old Testament and New Testament made it clear that their stories were not like the pagan mythical stories, blending the realm of gods and humans. And just a few examples. Look at Psalm 19.1. How clearly the sky reveals God's glory. How plainly it shows what he has done. Um, Genesis 7 verse 11. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the outlets of the vast body of water beneath the earth burst open. All the floodgates of the skies were open and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? I mean, that's a... Those are things which we can understand. Maybe we don't understand the extent of it, but we understand it. And it goes on. Lots of other passages there that you can get if you get our handout. These verses should make it clear that when Bible writers talked about things like the windows of heaven, they were simply writing figuratively such as rain pouring from the sky. Notice a couple of other differences between the biblical story and one of the ancient Mesopotamian stories known as the myth of Enuma Elish. In that story, Marduk created mankind by murdering Tiamat and spitting, splitting her in half and making humans out of her. As we have already noted in the creation account of Atrahasis, humans were created by mixing clay with the flesh and blood of a slaughtered god. I mean, is that really the way God works? No. In ancient Egypt, it was believed that life and death were a continuing cycle in which humans were self-generating or possibly emanations from the gods. So... What happens when you die? You just have to make provision that when you go to the other land, you're in good shape, so when you come back, you'll be in a better shape, and around and around and around you go. In the Bible, we are told that creation week consisted of seven literal days, and on that, that seventh day, God rested from all the work that he had done. Ancient Egyptians believed that the death of the sun god was repeated daily, and that was considered to be a pattern for human life as well. So when the sun goes down and you can't see it anymore, what does that mean? Dead. dead yes. Sun is dead. Well, we know better than that, don't we? A, uh, a 21st dynasty funeral papyrus 
shows a winged serpent with the caption, Death, the great God who made gods and men. A personification of death as a creator God and an impressive visual realization of the idea that death is a necessary feature of the world of creation. Uh, do we believe that? Does that make sense to us? I mean, do you have to have death in order to have life? Um, in light of all this, isn't it surprising that many moderns believe that the Bible is an antiquated book with little relevance to the major questions of the 21st century? Such people believe that there is no major difference between the creation and status of animals and the creation and status of human beings. And what does the story of Genesis say? Well, they, people think we are all just part of a line of evolution. Okay, in Hinduism... I've got that. In Hinduism, we evolve through reincarnation into another life form when we die, and God is, a, is in all and is all. According to Hinduism, there are 33 million gods as personified through nature. This concept goes back to the ancient Egypt, where there were 22,000 gods and where death and life were perceived as part of the great circle of life. And that's quoted, of course, from our Bible study guide. So, do you think it is important for us to recognize that the God we worship created Adam and Eve in a perfect sinless state at a time when death did not exist anywhere in the universe? Don't you like our version of things instead of all these other crazy ideas? Yeah. What do the ideas of evolution suggest precedes the creation of the first human being? Well, if you believe the story of evolution, there were millions of years of pain and death before humans ever existed. If God did not create humankind in the beginning as Adam and Eve, will he be able to recreate us at the time of the resurrection? And I always smile when I think about this because, I mean, Christians, virtually all Christians believe that what's going to happen? That God recreates us either at the time when we die or at the time when we're resurrected. Well, if he didn't have the ability to create us back in the beginning or if we came through an evolutionary train, what's Where's God can come from out of this sea? And does he have the ability to recreate us? It, 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 the whole thing doesn't make any sense if you, if you look at it all together as a piece. So we are very blessed to have a linear pattern of history, a biblical story from the beginning with Revelation 12, 7 through 12, where it talks about the, the war that began up in heaven and all the way down through all the generations, through creation, through the flood, through Abraham, and down to the times of Christ, and down to our day, all in a clear historical pattern. Aren't you glad? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to worship you and to realize that you have all these things planned ahead of time, and you have them organized historically in very reasonable and rational ways. We thank you for revealing to us all of these truths. May we respect you, and may we be, have the courage to stand up for these truths that you have presented in Scripture when we have opportunity, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.